questions. And um, I've got more sheets that look exactly like this. If you want to start your own, um, you can, I'll hand those around too. But one of these I want to be my sheet that comes back to me. So just fill it in, and then it's another way we can keep in touch. Um, I realize obviously we can go back and get on, you know, on the internet and do it. But I also still like to have my print version beforehand because I lose things on it. So, but I've got a lot more. If anybody wants, as I say, to use it, I'm a teacher, so I'm used to organizing people and thoughts and ideas. So I'll pass this bundle around, and if it's useful to you today, please use it. So um, I'll just start by saying, you know, I didn't know who was going to wind up here today, but I initially, um, when I found out about my camp, it was just through some searches and research that I was doing on the net myself because I was looking into podcasting to use in a high school here in Toronto. Um, a little bit about my background. First of all, I feel really comfortable being here today for a number of reasons. One, because I am a Ryerson graduate myself. Uh, came out of this building, well, not this building, but the building across the way when we had uh, big uh, reels of videotape that we were using for television and video. And um, so that was back in the, the 80s. And um, uh, so I feel comfortable because I'm back where I began. And uh, after that, I actually worked in broadcasting for about seven years. So I was trained in radio and television production. I worked in broadcasting. And then I became a teacher right at the time that media studies was an important part, was becoming an important part of the curriculum. Um, it was long before we had any such thing as uh, programs called ComTech or all these other things that we now have. Um, and so the history behind those people who were teaching how to make films and how to make videos and all do all of that production work was generally maybe a history teacher in a classroom somewhere or an English teacher in a classroom somewhere who knew and saw the value of integrating media into, you know, into their curriculum. And of course, right from the beginning, um, production has always been one third expectation of those courses. It's written in the documents. And I, I, again, for those people that tend to disagree with this opinion, it's usually because they don't, simply don't know. So I brought in um, all of the, the written affidavits here right from the curriculum documentation here in Ontario, which of course is my experience. So if you're coming from out of province or out of Canada, of course, you might also just want to look and see what we are doing and must be doing in our courses. And again, I'm talking about the secondary level. Now, the primary and elementary levels, I've worked and taught teachers over the years as well how to incorporate production into their courses as well. But their course expectations in their courses are a little bit different. But you can translate what we're doing at the secondary level back down to what teachers today, again, by curriculum uh, documentation must be doing in their classes um, in language studies, also in the, um, in the primary levels. It's a big part of the expectation of the Ministry of Education. And a lot of people don't realize that. And so we've, we've wound up in a world where everybody just thinks they're the only one that's doing it, or they're the only one that's supposed to do it, because they've never bothered to read what the curriculum expectations are of you know, other educators. And I began as a media teacher, which was English curriculum. I'm now a media teacher as an English curriculum teacher, but I'm also a comm tech teacher, which is part of technological studies here in Ontario. And I've read the documentation in both. And interestingly enough, um, again, because of the history of how a lot of this is involved, um, I found a lot more expectations, specific expectations to production in the English media strand that we have here in Ontario than I actually even did in the comm tech strand here. And a lot of teachers don't realize that. So I'm here also to bridge that gap and open up the dialogue and for people to realize that uh, we all are trying to do the same thing from different angles. And if you are a teacher, especially here you know, in Ontario and you're following the guidelines at the secondary level, you should be aware that what you're doing either as a contact teacher or as a media studies teacher complement each other so directly that if you're working separately, you are really losing a golden opportunity in your school and your kids ultimately are losing a golden opportunity in your school. So uh, one of the things I will pass around, as I say afterwards, are the direct expectations that we see in the guidelines here in Ontario for what uh, high school teachers have to do in English, all the way from grade 9 to grade 12 with media studies. 
And then what um, the Com Tech teachers, our communications technology teachers, have to do here in Ontario in their grade 10, grade 11, and grade 12 courses where they're supposed to be doing some production as part of that course as well. Right? And the only difference is the wording. In one case, it's called production work. In one case, it's called creating media work. It's the same thing. It's the very same thing. And when you look at the expectations, you'll see how similar they are. Um, so what I handed around really is something that I want all of us to work with today to start dialoguing and talking about. It. I don't want to be the one to stand up here and tell you what to do because everybody is in a different circumstance. Um, I really thought that the majority of people who would probably show up to this session would be educators who are thinking of using podcasting in some form in their classroom or they want to share it with another teacher to use in their classroom or perhaps even you're a parent and you want to go back as a member of a council and say why isn't this happening in my school you know, or whatever. Because, and you should be aware that media is a, a standard and expected part of language curriculum in our elementary studies here in our schools right now, and then again in the secondary level, it's one third of what gets evaluated in every English class, and there is a standalone media class um, offered at grade 11 level also in most high schools, right? And in communications technology, we have uh, built-in programs uh, depending on the school. In uh, high school, it could be you simply have a computer lab, and somebody calls that communications technology. In another school, you could have a computer lab and a television studio and editing facilities and you know audio facilities and the ability to maybe do some podcasting. Unfortunately, we live in a time where it's not standard across the board, and it's up to the teachers usually to determine what's going to happen in those schools. And we often have to. Anybody sitting here in the audience as a teacher knows we often have to go you know to the woman or man in charge and say you know here's the expectations. What are you going to do for me? You know the ministry is telling me I got to teach this in my class. How are you going to help me do that? Um, it doesn't come from the top down, unfortunately. From my experience since being a teacher since 1988, I've seen that it's usually the teachers that bring these programs into the schools when they realize that the documentation tells them they're supposed to be doing it. And they want to do what you know they're supposed to be doing to make their courses viable and obviously to be fulfilling the needs for the kids. Um, so I wanted to just sort of use this sheet together in some form, you know, in the limited time we've got. And the first thing that you might just want to look at on your own for a minute, if you are an educator, is the top of the sheet where it just asks you, you know, what curriculum expectations you're hoping podcasting is going to fulfill in whatever situation you're in. And again, if you're not an educator, you'll have to bear with those of us who are, but maybe think about how, you know, this is something perhaps that you could be helping us, you know, in some way. If you're from industry, you know, we need your support in this. If you're a parent, we need your support in this, because again, obviously, sometimes we don't have the, um, the economics in the schools or the facilities in the schools, and it is, you know, yet we have guidelines from the people that, you know, tell us what we're supposed to be teaching, telling us we're supposed to be doing these things, but they're not providing us what we need. That kind of suggests to me, like, I, I always look at the ministry expectations and I go, oh, I'm supposed to be teaching that. Okay, well, that hasn't been part of the course here for years. Um, maybe some aspects specifically of electronic repair or something like this. It's like, okay, well, maybe that's something that a podcast that was written, that was scripted, that was recorded, that's accessible because it's cheap to make, could cover that expectation if we did a distribution. And then we would also be whatever its message would be at the same time. That might be one way that we could cover stuff that otherwise we don't cover. Absolutely. Um, who her is a teacher, first of all? Okay, so, and can I just then get a sense of who else is here? Like, you know, what you're doing, why you had an interest in this workshop? Just hands up on a time now. I represent York University. I'm here because we're looking at podcasting to help prospective students on their applications to the university. Fabulous. I'm Stephen. I'm from Student Life Education Company, a not-for-profit organization that sends out messaging to the high schools and all that. We're part of NSED, OSED, SIED, SAD, um, all those organizations were one of the, the ones that run it. So uh, podcasting for us uh, ends going to the, the teachers that are facilitators, then goes to the end user, which are the students. But we're noticing that the end user is actually coming onto our site and using our product or our conversation more so than just the teachers. So actually your feedback would be great on how we can move forward into uh, you know, an end user conversation, but by using your facilitator um, and supporting the students. 
Yes, thank you. Excellent. And any other backgrounds or things? Yeah. Um, <laughs> just your that information and we'll be doing speech on podcasts in the school. Fabulous. So maybe I could like incorporate some information. Great. So you're are you at your school though, have they tried some podcasting as well? Uh not really, no. I'm okay. trying to get them to try. <laughs> okay, well bug the teachers for sure. Um, so I, I'm uh, on the board of a little library in Montreal, and we're just just starting a new project called the Digital Literacy Project, and we're building workshops for um, at-risk youth and some community groups as well to um, help them with digital projects, podcasting, you know, so in the education side. Yeah. Um, I'm a fourth-year software engineering student at the University of Waterloo. Um, I guess I'm a prolific podcast listener and I just want to see sort of how different niches are thinking about using podcasting and where I could help in terms of software. Um, I know from my experience, I, I teach at a school up in the northwest end of Toronto, Weston and Finch, if you're familiar with Toronto at all. Um, and therefore, it's a very transient community. It's a very low income community, uh, a lot of single uh, parent families. Uh, people from all over the world, a lot of ESL um, people, in, you know, in this, coming in and out of the school. So, um, for me, as an educator, um, I see podcasting fulfilling so many different curriculum expectations. Um, one, of course, is from the production standpoint. You know, the fact that if I am teaching media studies, I must be doing production. That's one third of what I have to evaluate. Um, if I'm a commu communications technology teacher, I'm supposed to be talking about the ramifications of, um, of communications technology, exposing students to communications technology, having them use it, so then they can discuss the impact of these technologies on society. That is one of many expectations in the communications technology area. Um, so, obviously I have to give that hands-on experiential experience. Well, I've been doing that until now with video cameras and digital cameras and um, you know, voice recording and all those other technologies we've had, but now we're at that point where even though podcasting isn't brand new, it's still relatively new and, and actually brand new to some of our students. Teenagers aren't really aware of podcasting. When I talk to my students and I mention the word, they do not know what it is in the schools where, where I teach. Now, depending on the socioeconomic part of the city you might live in, if you're in Toronto or in other places, they will know about it, right? Yeah. I just have a question about that. Do they know about MySpace? Of course. Yeah. And, so and Facebook. Yeah. And Facebook. Right now, MySpace is all news. Yeah. Facebook. Facebook. <laughs> um, so, you know, keeping up with that is, you know, is unbelievable too. It constantly changes. It's that whole business of what's hyped the most. And podcasting isn't hyped, really, because podcasting is such narrow casting, as was mentioned earlier in some of the other sessions you know, we've had today. Um, it, you know, it's not broadcasting, and the kids, our kids, our students, our teenagers don't hear about those things. They hear about the mass-produced things, because that's the world they live in. Yet, it's the perfect place for them, I think, to speak and get their voices heard and provide alternative communications. So as an English teacher, whether I was teaching production or not, I, you know, and I know there are English teachers using podcasting because they can read their poetry, they can write their short stories, they can, and they can have the interaction. I know there, you know, there's people in the audience who are concerned about that, that feedback that comes back. It's not just sending the voices out, but having that feedback back. They want it, if they have feedback from other people their own age, it means something to them too, right? When you're in school and you do something for the mark from the teacher, it's not the same as doing something to be heard by someone else who's your peer and get their feedback. You know, it doesn't matter that, you know, it's a, a rubric three or a rubric one, you know, for the, tech, the uh, terminology that we use by today's education standards. It's, um, it's more important that somebody says, did you hear, you know, so-and-so read their poem? Wasn't that cool? You should, you know, go to that site and listen to it. So, and I think we've got a lot of young people today who unfortunately live in a world where they don't, they're, they're not being built, their self-esteem is not being built because they're looking out at all these other role models who, you know, they can't possibly aspire to. Uh, so, as an educator, as I say, there's many ways that I think I can meet certain expectations in the curriculum. And I, I just want you, you know, obviously in your own individual circumstances to consider, you know, but be very specific with what expectations you personally have as an educator, but also what's driven by the people who, you know, tell you what's supposed to be in your courses as well. Um, it might be
be actually a good time. I'll just pass these around. There's um, one set here shows you everything all the way from grade 9 to grade 12. What is expected for using communications technology and media production and things like that um, in the high schools from 9 to 12, including the, what we call that our open grade 11 course, uh, media studies course here in Ontario. So you can peruse it and just keeps you more informed if you're not an educator. Can you pass the first one around? Yeah, absolutely. And then the other set was um, our grade 10, grade 11, and grade 12, some samples of the expectations. And again, this is just cut and paste straight from ministry documents that teachers must follow when they're delivering their courses in Ontario. Um, that shows you know, where some podcasting might fit in here as well. And obviously, there's many ways. Yeah, you're saying to the production has to be 30%. Is that the same as application? In, in, in the media studies course, yes. um, we, uh, for those of you that are, are teachers um, at the high school level, in the media studies course, if you're teaching the, the grade 11 and standalone media studies course, um, you don't use the categories communications thinking, um, knowledge. Those are not the categories we use. We use text, audience, and production, and that's it. Yeah. And so when we evaluate students' activities or tests or whatever it is, we, um, we assess or evaluate based on something where they were learning about the content of that material or creating content for that material, that's text. Mm -hmm. uh, audience, where they're reflecting on how they reacted to something or who something was made for, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, or, and, and then production, where they make those things and they have to consider the text for the audience as they're making Yes, I understand that the communications technology uh, are under review for the moment. Yes. They're all changed. They changed the application, which is, I guess, our version of the production. That's right. Now, it's 20% of the time. That's the fine arts and media arts. Yeah. From what these students were about 50%. I think they're moving the same direction of tech. I'm just wondering how that's going to affect the difference. Yeah, I don't know. And they're constantly in flux. Um, just as I was just at, um, uh, I guess it was like a consultative committee meeting with teachers from all over. Um, on Toronto who were giving feedback to the ministry for the new curriculum guidelines for, for English and uh, the media strand, they call them strands in terms of the different areas of, that we, we cover. Um, the media strand now, um, an, an additional part of studying media or creating media is also what we call metacognition where we must now as teachers also do that reflective education. So not only do I teach you how and then you do it, but then I also have to now have you play back what did you learn by doing it and you know, discuss what effect did it have on you as an audience member or what effect did it have on you as the producer. You know, what was your was frustration with the fact that you had to get the story over two minutes and you know, you only had a week to create it or something like that. Um, so that met, what we call metacognition is now, it was never written into the curriculum documentation, it is now also going to be written into the curriculum documentation. So every year, every few years, there's some other level or some other way that we have to approach this. You know, it's just the terminology that changes. Um, I, I have a question about the laws around podcasting for schools and youth and putting them on there. Because um, we do national programs. Mm -hmm. You know that the province for province and territory, they're all different. And as for a person that actually wants to show a lot of the stuff, um, the, the Ontario laws, I'm not very clear sure about that. So uh, for a not-for-profit like me trying to show podcasts that your students have created for us, like, what are the laws around that? Well, one of the things I know does happen is when a student comes into, like at the high school level, when they come into the school at the end of the year, they sign a contract. Um, that says that if you get used for a website or for a yearbook or you know, any public um, you know, performance, that that covers it. So I would assume that the boards are assuming that that piece of paper that those students are filling out also would um, cover something like podcasting. Now, then though there is the concept, as we know, you know, if you're telling kids to set up a website or you know, do podcasting, do they give their real name and all of that? And I think those obviously are ethical issues we as educators have to think about, you know, would I feel comfortable telling my students to give their full name? Absolutely not. You know, if they were going to be speaking on, you know, out there, because they're still young people until they're 18, you know, ultimately we, the adults, are responsible for them. So whether I'm the teacher or the principal or a parent or whatever. So I would say, you know, first names only, um, you know, never give any, you know, personal information. And I would keep it, like if we were podcasting from my class, 
my suggestion would be, you know, you're just talking, you know, class, you know, like I'm lab six, so we would say lab six, you know, we wouldn't even necessarily know what school it was or something, right? That would be up to the individual school, I think, to make those decisions. Okay. Yeah, because like I, I'm having a concept that I want to create a live streaming event in October. It's a national students can compare and distract the driving data that happens for the last nine years. And uh, basically I want like individual classes or schools to create a cast or a pod or be on there. Um, but I'm finding the laws and I'm having a hard time getting around the laws and also enrolling the teachers to do so. And yes, we, we get the name thing. Um, but since we do national programs, like it's uh, that's what I'm finding the hard part about it. So I'm wondering if there's any way that anybody could. Uh, there's an administrator in the crowd who might have done it. I think you need to contact the communications person at the board and they tell you what the policy is. Probably um, that sort of thing you'd have to market to kids individually out right there. I don't know that the board would support anything. We have a, I think it's called the internet. So a lot of the work we would do would be look at the fire school board and that would not be accessible even for the homes of the kids. So I don't know if I made that clear. Probably not as an organization would we sign on to the event, but the individual kids from their homes with the support of the campus would obviously that communication person would have to work. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I've had a class draw for in grade two and three for about six years. And these private conditions are something our board has a good internet privacy policy, amongst other things. Um, no direct individual pictures of children. We can take pictures of teams, so I do get pictures of them. For instance, one of the main class pictures that will be on my class blog in any given year is the Halloween costumes. They're in disguise. I take <laughs> lots, lots of back and head shots of them doing their art projects. Um, first names only on the art gallery that I put up. And it, we often send emails, we just recently sent an email to Peter, Paul, and Mary, and uh, it's a shared writing, it's way too, I tell them, I'm typing it, you tell me what to type. And, but it originates from my email address, I have the control, only first names, and in fact, I, I, I've refined it over the years, and now we only say, this is Mr. McGaggy's way to class in Midland, Ontario. I don't even name the school right, anymore, right. I'm heading yeah. up to the world. Yeah, that seems to be a wise, a wise decision from the view that I've gone on to and, and listened to. Um, so really, because we don't have a lot of time, I, I want to sort of just generate communication in the room. It doesn't have to come from up here. I don't want it to come from up here. You know, the next question was, if you've heard some educational quality sample podcasting, share it with some other people. You know, like I, of course, I didn't bring my list, but there, um, you know, there's a site, for instance, out of California where there's a high school in California um, with students who sound very much like my students, but they're in California, and rather than having kids from Sri Lanka and uh, Iran and Afghanistan in their classrooms, they've got kid, you know, Mexicans and a lot of Hispanic-speaking students and you know, students coming from other parts of the world because of where they're located, but they have the same issues. So they're getting on and they're talking about what it's like to be a single mom and going to high school. They're talking about, um, you know, why um, they, they got off drugs. They're talking about, you know, those things that concern them and they want to share with, with other kids. Um, there's an elementary class in Scotland that's, um, that's doing this. And you hear these lovely Scottish voices coming from these little kids reading their poetry and talking about, you know, their assembly that day or sharing a story about what happened, you know, in the village, wherever, you know, they are, that kind of thing. Um, you know, so there's many things happening already out there in schools where they are podcasting. We have some great ones here in the city already as well. So just share, just take a minute and share some ones that you might know about with people sitting around you, by all means. Or if you want, we can shut it out and I can throw, throw it up here. I mean, whatever you would like. As a group? Okay, so you know of an actual site? Podcast. I mean, you can usually just get Google Educational Podcast to get something. But does anybody actually have sites that they've gone to that they know about? You mean podcasts from? It could be from a school or for a school. A classroom that you're doing it. Uh, mine isn't quite on, um, but it is for schools. All the language wants like copyright Spanish. Uh, it's called copyright Spanish. Yeah, and it's through something with Frank Lingua Franca. Is the site, but copy copyright. 
story. But it's it's hilarious. It's, it's Spanish lessons run by a, a man and woman with very heavy Scottish accents in English. <laughs> and the concept is in 20 minutes you can, on your copy break, every day you can learn some Spanish. Have you heard of Grammar Girl? I yeah. got it yeah. from iTunes. And it's brilliant as an English teacher with teenagers. I, for sure, I'm going to be playing them for them. Because it's, they're very quick, they're maybe three minutes, you know, no longer than three minutes. They give tips on how to write that opening paragraph, or why uh, there's a difference between high E and EG, which even most adults don't know the difference about, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, she's great, Grammar Girl. Last year, I was a moment in science, which my day is over. The great moment in science is that we're playing our pen in and in and out. One thing and a really good grabber for and see, you know, what I like to do, you know, the terminology in education is exemplars, right? So I'm gonna play these for my students and then I'm gonna have my students create their own podcast. You know, we'll devise our own idea for a podcast. But I obviously I need to give them some examples of what other people are doing first. I can't just say there's this thing called a podcast and now we're gonna sit down and write a script. Right? I have to have them listen to it or watch it if it's a video podcast, you know, first and get some ideas. Uh, another one of my favorites is Mr. Manners is the site is Mr. Manners Tips for a, a quick and dirty tips for a more polite life. And it's three minutes and it's adult topics like how to split the check for the bill when you're in a restaurant how to decline a blind date. But it would be fun for kids to hear it as an exemplar and then do their own push dirty tips for sure. a more polite teen role. Maybe even show what not to do. There's one that's not, I don't know if it fits in, but Homeless Nation. Um, right, which we heard about this morning. I definitely will play that for media study students especially, because we have to talk about alternatives in right. media. You know, what we're trying to do is point out we've got this world of mass media that's convincing us, you know, there's all the hype and there's the persuasion and, you know, products and buy, buy, buy. But, you know, what's the, who's getting alternative voices? And I think that's, that's one of the So it's Homeless Nation, right? Yeah, for sure. I'm going to be getting on to that one. Okay, I, I, I wanted to kind of it's a little bit soft promotion, but uh, <laughs> I have a video podcast. It's called ChelloJourney.com. Cello Journey. And basically, I play the cello with the pianist. And the neat thing is, it's classical music. So I've been really thinking about taking it into the schools because I just sit there and play and I talk about the music. And uh, I've gotten some emails from teachers like, wow, oh, this is great. I'm going to use this in my. I haven't gotten around to like, creating an educational component with it, but already it's something that amuses students. Mm -hmm. I spoke about one earlier today that's not educational, it's just a father and son in California, it's called the SG Show, and it's just a delightful show to listen to. It's his father and his young son doing this podcast, and they talk about, and so you hear that they went to such a Harry Potter, this Harry Potter movie that weekend, and then they, the child reviews it, and the father asks them questions, and there's discussion back and forth, there's um, moral lessons, you know, what happened yesterday, I heard you, you know, um, you, you stayed out later than your mom wanted you to stay. Yeah, you know, whatever we deal with that problem. And so you hear how the family goes through problem solving. You hear about you know issues that we all deal with in our own homes as parents, which our kids only. It's the parent and kid talking. So if you sit there with your own children, they're getting it from a different level than you're getting it, and you're sharing it. And you can talk about it. And it leads to more discussion. It's just delightful. It's called the SG Show. And again, teenagers don't like. Um, you know, if they listen to other people their own age that they don't know, that's not cool. Those kids, those kids aren't cool even though they're exactly like them, right? <laughs> they're not cool. But if they listen to young kids, then it's, oh, they're so sweet, and you know, then it gives them ideas for what they can do. But teenagers hate admitting that those other teenagers are just like them, right? <laughs> or they're just like those other teenagers. Um, there's uh, a, a really keen LibriVox volunteer named Kara, and she does uh, something called this. It's kray.org. K-A-Y-R-A-Y, and she does this, um, K-A-Y-R-A-Y, -Y. Okay. and she does uh, um, children's, public domain children's books, but uh, she's, she's got a great voice. She, she started doing the LibriVox because she used to record stuff for her son, um, 
Also, if you just, seriously, if you just Google educational podcasts, you'll get to some amazing ones coming out of the UK, Scotland, um, a number of different places where they're coming out of classrooms. And you'll get some of the, the ones, you know, here in Toronto as well. There's some, some good ones coming, especially out of the elementary schools. I've heard some interesting ones recently. Uh, another neat one for modeling, not uh, kit-based, is Discovery Moods. And it's, it's three-minute flips on a recent discovery. It's, always quirky and catchy and we need the kids to do their own history moment or whatever. Okay, so we don't have a lot of time, so just shout out specific projects you think, you know, also might be successful. What you know, what could work? I mean obviously they can make a podcast, but more specifically, you know, what what could they be doing? What could we have I know, whether it's elementary panel, middle school, you know, secondary school, what are things that you could see that maybe you've thought of and somebody else hasn't thought of yet that would work? I think just the idea of the teenagers actually debating issues that are coming up in the schools, like a ban the use of headgear, the pros and the cons, and debating controversial issues. Other mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Current issues in the school. Yeah. Going around and interviewing their peers and getting their opinions on things yeah. and putting those on. Yeah. I agree. I was going to add to that, especially the more disturbing issues that affect students, like uh, peer bashing, um, violence in schools overall. And that affect the community. I'm thinking of things that perhaps, um, or one issue that I'm thinking would be useful in the region park, which has a cat, feral cat uh, overpopulation problem, is to make residents and students aware of uh, how it can be prevented or you know, how they can be involved in the region mm -hmm. yeah. And I find, you know, my my take the last few years on teenagers is that, they, is that they really feel disconnected. They're so disconnected from life. They come in, they're negative, they're tired, they have no enthusiasm for anything, for anything. How is that different from when we were teenagers? <laughs> <laughs> I love school, I ran to school, my friends were there, it was a social thing. It was a social thing, it's not social anymore. It's, it's dysfunctional. And and, um, and so we, you know and so what is it you know it's not because it's not what's happening in the school that makes them that way it's the communities that they're coming from that's doing that the large community that's doing that right that doesn't get created in school they're bringing that into school so we have, so connecting them to a large community I like sitting down with my students and just saying talk to me about you know your community not the school talk to me about what's happening out there. And that's when they need to make that connection with where they fit. Where do they fit? Who are they? They're a brother, they're a son, they're a, they're, you know, a sister, they're, they might even be a parent. They might, you know, who are they? And having them recognize who they are on this planet and therefore connecting them to all those other people like them. They, they don't see that anymore. They don't see that. They're so isolated. I'm just curious, I'm um, probably straying off topic a bit, but is, do you think there's a relationship between that and the fact that kids live so much with MySpace and I think it's a, I don't think it's the only thing, but it's definitely part of the puzzle, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I would say probably 50% of the discipline that we handle in school originates on MSN and Facebook and all those things, and uh, I think this is the perfect way to channel that they are um, tuned to the net, they're electronically connected at I think most points of their day, and so to give them a structure is a great thing. We assume that they have skills and they have literacy and they know how to um, judge the value of content and they don't. No, they they don't. don't. They don't. It, you know, it's, they have sophistication on a very superficial level. You know, they know my, you know, they know my space, they know Facebook, they know these things, they know what iPods, they, you know, they know the word they just got her hair you know, shaved and, you know, but if you get any farther, if you try to say, why do you think she did that or, you know, who's paying her to do that or, you know, whatever, whatever, it's, there's nothing there. Yeah. I was just wondering, have you had, have you done a little bit of podcasting in the schools and are those kids enthusiastic? Well, I, I, when, I ha when I have introduced what it is, they said, yeah, it sounds cool. Yeah. And they'd love to do that. Yeah. But can I just, how, how do you distribute it to your students? Like, if you actually podcast, considering that you can't uh, offer from the Max using a TV USB system legally, how do you actually get the podcast so you can have the students see them and read them? Okay, in terms of like at home. 
Well, I have one more, like, and you could create one in your classroom and you look at it in that specific terminal right there. But say your class creates something you want to share with the school or with students in the community outside of the building, how do you distribute it within the framework of the Toronto District School Board or whatever school board you have? Uh, well, I think it, that's where we have to we have to link, obviously, with each other. We have to get it out there. You know, we've got, for instance, in Toronto District School Board, we've got Tell, and you can get out to conferences and say, "Have you heard about this? Have you heard about that?" How the teachers are going to find out about it. Okay. And students, and we we now, fortunately, in an age where I don't know, school isn't like overwhelmed with computers right now. So, so the kids have that. Right? Have to have a post to put it up. There. Sorry, Tell. I just I just got an answer a few moments ago. Uh -huh. Tell the new version coming out in March. Training folks on post global podcasts. Whoa. That's fabulous. That's, that's good to hear. That's our network in the Toronto District School Board. Yeah. But again, I mean, I think all these other ones that we've heard about today and other workshops, you know, we can do that as well. Most students have computers at home, even even if they're underprivileged, the computer is generally there. Um, I just want to add another to your list. It's kind of a totally different thing, but um, Julian Smith is one of the organizers here as a podcast. He swears a lot, I think, but uh, so in, in over your head, Doc. Well, actually, uh, more applicable is listen to your kids. Yeah, yeah. that's you started, right? Yeah. But so, in over your head, it's, I find it great because Julian is like the tip, like what you would want to bring into your, um, your high school class. It's a guy who just decided to start podcasting. Looks like a freak. He's got crazy hair. He's got tattoos and stuff in his ears and all that kind of thing. Um, and he podcasts about hip hop, so it's music that they're probably listening to. But it's, he he talks the language that kids talk, and, and he's the stuff he says is actually he's got a really good yeah. um, sort of message behind it. And he started a project called Listen to Your Kids. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Listen to your kids. So listen to your dot anything. Dot. Listen to your kids. Either net or com. Um, and the idea is to phone in, that kids can phone in um, and just leave a message for their parents. And it's, it's a, a podcast where um, just there's no editing or anything, just kids can leave whatever they want to say to their parents. And the idea is to try to get parents listening to what kids are saying yeah. and kids talking yeah. to their parents. And ultimately, to me, the ultimate goal would be that once the students are out there and, they, and we let other people in the community know about it, other students who aren't in the classroom who might have created it start getting involved. And then dialogue starts happening between the young people themselves. You know, ultimately it should then be out of my hands as the teacher who initiated the project and they start running it and they start, you know, creating the content and dealing with the content and reviewing the content, etc., etc. Um, we all know we, we're here at the podcast and talk, but the most fun is doing and creating. Now, I'm in a position as a primary teacher where I have to do a lot of the doing. Our class blog is like I've got the artwork up, I get put audio up when I can, I put message to the parents, it's an all purpose, I do it for everything I can. But it's still me doing it. And I, I, I reconcile myself that that's okay because it's their work. It's, yeah. Um, and I'm exposing them to this is another way to communicate. Yeah. So, uh, I think any of us who have you know, taught any courses that involve technology have found that ultimately the teacher still does you know, twice as much as they thought they would have, right? Because there's so many other conflicting demands on kids, etc. Et well, this is following up on your earlier discussion about uh, engaging the kids. Basically, the idea is to get them uh, in line with the idea that this is all citizen journalism. And that they are citizen journalists just by the fact of their age. And in 10, ten years, they'll, they'll, they'll have no choice. You know, you talk about you being the, the person of the year. Well, you know, it's, in some ways, it's them. Just because in the, you know, the flow of especially Western society, they're going to be blogging and podcasting. You know? And uh, so I mean, the earlier you can kind of get that message to them, you know, I mean, it might be sort of, uh, you know, I, I, like, um, like what Hugh's doing is doing a lot of preventative work. I mean, that, that might be uh, empowering the kids, you know, showing them that this is something that they can, it's an outlet for them right now, or at a young age for those who are doing primary work, you know. Yeah. Just to feel like you know, they have an outlet for these emotions and, uh, and energies, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, we could go on. I'm hoping you'll walk away with these sheets and you can fill in the blanks and it'll help you if it's something you're trying to start up yourself. You know, the question is, you know, what do you already have available in the school? You really want to do some research to find out. 
because as you know, from some of the workshops we've seen, it doesn't take much. We have, sometimes we think it's going to take so much to do this, and we've seen in some of the other workshops today, it doesn't really take that much. Um, and then what do you still need to purchase? Um, tips from your peers, you know, use these sheets yourself to start sort of keeping your own notes on it. And then the, the last one just sort of gets back to, again, that metacognition thing, you know, that exploring afterwards the benefits and the risks and the ethics associated with this form of communication seminars, not just doing it, but then coming back and talking about it with the young people today. You know, this is an alternative form of communication, and what are the benefits of it? What are the risks of it? You know, what are the ethics associated with it? Well, concept, you know, most students today, if you talk to them about, you know, you know, don't download music, they couldn't, they couldn't care less that they are stealing music. They couldn't care less. So, you know, you how do you get those ideas across to them, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And I talk about this, so you know, think about how those things are going to have to come up in a classroom. Mm -hmm. Finally, um, if you're not a media studies teacher, but you're a communication technology teacher, still AML, the Association for Media Literacy, um, or if you're just involved in education in any way, an excellent organization to get to know, Association for Media Literacy. They have a website, and they, I mean, you become a member for thirty dollars a year. Anybody can become a member. Um, they have a bulletin that they put online with suggestions for things to do with everybody from JK up to grade 12. Um, parents can do with their kids, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, a really good source in terms of talking about the media in general. And of course, you know, podcasting will come out of that. Thank you. I hope